In the last video, we came up with a rough outline for the ball machine superstructure. In this video, we're going to start building it. Going back to my earliest ball machines, they've been supported by box trusses. They're quick to build, lightweight, and very strong. This simple beam made of blue rods with yellow diagonals can support compressive loads of 100 pounds or more. However, things get more complicated as soon as any part of the beam is loaded under tension. The purple 3D connectors slide apart, causing the beam to fail. This can be fixed by adding X-shaped diagonals to help hold the 3D connectors together. Notice how the beam only fails in tension on the edge without the X diagonals. Adding X diagonals on two opposing sides now gives us a beam that is reasonably good at resisting tension and compression on all four sides. And going one step further with X's on all four sides will give us an even stronger beam that can easily handle forces from any direction. Ordinarily, I would design my beams based largely on the static loads I would expect them to encounter in normal operation, mostly the weight of the machine itself. However, with this machine there will be one key difference. I have to be able to move it. That means beams which are ordinarily only ever subjected to compression will now be flipped and turned in all sorts of unpredictable ways as the machine is picked up and carried and loaded and unloaded. Knowing this, I've decided to make all the box trusses in the superstructure of this machine with X diagonals on all four sides, just to be safe. Additionally, I've decided to make them blue rod sized instead of my usual red rod size. This is because I don't want the box truss to take up valuable space that could be used for ball tracks. I know this will be a lot of pieces, but since this relatively small machine is being built from the remains of a much larger machine, I think I should have enough to do it. Alright, with that out of the way, we can finally start building. We're going to start by blocking off the dimensions of the machine on the floor with some tape, then constructing a perimeter using blue rods. I'm leaving gaps here for the eventual separation points I discussed in the last video, but I'll figure out exactly how those work later on. The next step is the tedious and thumb-destroying process of filling in the rest of the box trusses on the bottom of the machine. Okay, so it looks like I didn't account for the ends of the connectors when I was figuring out how wide each section should be and it's not actually going to fit through my doors. Uh, this isn't a super huge problem, I'll just kind of have to fudge things a bit, offsetting some parts by a green rod or so, but it will mean that the three sections are no longer going to be perfectly identical, so that's kind of annoying. But anyway, I finished filling the rest of the box truss for the base layer, and now I'm adding some additional beams in the interior so each section can split apart into its own rectangular frame. I'm also adding some diagonal bracing to help keep each section perfectly square. Notice how the bracing is different on the right hand section. This is because of the offset separation points I mentioned earlier. It's pretty unsatisfying to look at, but at least it is very strong, and it will all eventually be covered up by the sloped ball return ramps, so hopefully nobody will notice. Speaking of the ball return ramps, I've run into another issue at this point. The next step should be to build the supports so I can attach the return ramps, but I actually have no idea how high up they need to be. The sloped floor has to be high enough to drop balls onto the return ramp, which has to be high enough to feed balls into the waiting area of the main lift. I was really hoping to get all the framework done first before I did any work on the main lift, but I think I'm going to have to shift gears here and start figuring out the lift first. For this machine, I've decided to go with a classic big ball factory style chain lift. I'll be going into a lot more detail about why I made that decision in a couple episodes, but suffice it to say that I want a lift that's reliable, repairable, and redundant. In order to determine the height of the ball return ramps, we need to know the height of the ramp that loads the balls onto the chain. 
Usually that might look something like this. A simple track with walls on either side and a tongue sticking out the middle that allows a forked chain hook to pass through. However, this simple design would be prone to breaking. Using longer rods attached to the bottom with orange clips might work, but the spacing of the rods interferes with the spacing of the chain hooks just a little bit too much. Replacing the rods with a simple truss that is squished together at the bottom, using white rods, solves that issue quite well, and provides a nice wedge shape to help align the chain hooks as they pick up the balls. The truss design also allows for a stop to be built onto one end of the tongue to securely hold the balls in place and prevent them from bumping into the moving chain as they wait. So for redundancy, I plan to have three parallel chain lifts. They will all pick up and deposit the balls from the same place, so if any two chain lifts break, the machine can continue operating. This approach requires a way to divide the balls between the three lifts at the bottom of the machine, while also ensuring that if any path backs up, balls will automatically be routed to an open path. To test this properly, I quickly built a rigid box truss frame to support the ball divider and hold it at a slight angle. Adding a short ramp to give the ball some momentum seems to be helping. Now that the divider seems to be working well enough, we can start to build the corresponding chain sprockets. And here's where the repairability comes in. Per my original design, I plan to have the chain lift fully enclosed in a protective cage that kind of swings open like a door to allow for easy maintenance. So I have to figure out some sort of hinge mechanism to attach the chain sprockets to the ball divider. The sprockets have to sit at the perfect distance from the ball loading ramps, so the chain hooks can pick up the balls without the chains rubbing against any part of the structure. This hinge mechanism allows the entire structure to swing open for easy access, rolling on a set of wheels, and still keeps the perfect alignment for loading the balls onto the chain lifts. With this, we now know the height that the ball return ramps will need to be, and supporting structures can be built. At the same time, we'll build a bit of the cage that will enclose the chain lifts, because this is going to define the left edge of the ball return ramps. And this brings us to the sloped floor that runs across the bottom of the machine. This floor will be the end point for every path in the ball machine. Ordinarily, something like this would be built out of a grid of white connectors, which provide a relatively smooth rolling surface. However, the sloped floor in this case has to serve as a sort of safety net for any balls that fall from higher up. This means the floor will need to be able to withstand the impact of a ball falling from nearly 7 feet in the air, and after testing with a section of standard white connector floor, it simply doesn't seem to hold up to these kind of impacts. To attempt to solve this, I'm going to try something new. Building the floor out of a series of flat trusses spaced out by blue rods. The vertical orientation of the trusses prevents the pieces from coming apart in an impact, and in my repeated testing it seems to work quite well and the balls feed nicely into the return ramp. I have no idea how I'm going to attach this, by the way, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. In order to figure out the spacing and part count, I decided to make a 3D model of the entire floor. And it is 7,092 pieces. Wow. Well, let's get started. My friend Sam offered to help me work on this first section of floor while I start building up the supports for the other sections. In just a couple hours, we already had the first floor section finished. We then started working on a way to attach the floor to the supporting structure, and we quickly realized that every six floor sections exactly equals two and a half blue rod truss sections, or five green rods connected end to end. It's a weird geometry, and honestly I have no idea where this five to six ratio comes from, but it's enough to make something work. 
The back end of the sloped floor is a little easier, simply connecting to the long metallic green rods with spacers to make everything align perfectly. These metallic green rods will then form the back walls of the ball machine, a sort of netting running the entire height to make sure balls don't fall out of the sides. And now that I've got a basic design for the floor down, it's just a matter of doing it again. And again. I'll also build up a few inches of the side walls just for testing purposes, and also extend the ball return ramp the whole length of the machine, adding a wall along the front edge to make sure the balls stay on the ramp. Also, because this machine will need to be transported safely, how about a quick drop test? And speaking of transporting, yes, the segments do still fit through my door. Just barely. With that, the first stage of this project is now complete. Nothing to do now but have fun testing the ball return and dividing mechanisms while I think about what to work on next. That's it for this video. I'll be back in another month or two for part three, where we will bring the machine's superstructure to its full height. Thanks for watching.